Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy that you're all here. Uh, I think this will be a, a, a very um, interesting hour here with a, a, an amazing filmmaker. Uh, I first introduce myself. My name is Adriek Vernieuwers. I'm head of industry at ITVA. And it's my great honor and privilege to welcome this fantastic director here at stage, Wat El Kata. Welcome. Thank you. Um, this uh, session will be led by uh, Tessa. Uh, Tessa Boerman, she's a filmmaker from the Netherlands. And um, I think uh, she's also a great host. So uh, please, Tessa, take it away without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adric. Thank you. I'm just realizing, I'm sorry, I have to ask this before we start. Uh, Peter, or is this the camera for the footage? Is it? Yes. Because then it doesn't make sense, because I'm sitting here, and I think, what, should be sitting here? Camera. Ah, okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, welcome everyone. I'm welcome happy actually what? if I wasn't on the camera. So I know, that's why I luck. said. <laughs> no. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I cannot, Thank there's you. no words to express how much I appreciate your film. Thank you so much for doing this. And um, I know a lot of people say about a film, you have to see this film. But I'm saying you have to see this film. I'm not sure. Are there people who didn't see the film yet? Okay. Okay, I'm telling you, you have to see the film and tell everyone else you know that they have to see the film and particularly every government you have access to because unfortunately even us in the Netherlands, we are part of this conflict and we are uh, perpetuating uh, violence in one way or another. So every single person has to see this film. Um, what? There's so many things I want to talk to you about. No. We had a conversation already. Don't worry, uh, I'll give the floor also to you, um, but we'll have a talk first. Um, can you say something about how, you, how your journey was to becoming a filmmaker and making this film um, that ended up in the film For Sama? Yeah, so um, in 2011, when the Syrian revolution started, I was a student at Aleppo University, and I was doing marketing economics, like something totally different from where I am now. And during the first year of the revolution, I, not just me, like many other people who started filming by their mobile phone from the first protest, they joined uh, the, the people. And we felt that this is obviously something so important for us to start recording these things. We lived in a country where we've never been like open before for anything. Everything was controlled by the authorities and by the government. And like Hafez Assad, the father, ruled Syria for three, 30 years. And then the Bashar al-Assad, the son, he came automatically to be like the leader of Syria. Uh, in others, they said it's election, but it's not, not election, literally, where he just was, uh, like the announcement of that was like 99.99%. So we, like, we, we don't have even like, another choice to do this. It was yes or no. And no means like you will be arrested when you will get out from the elective like, room. So we knew that like, this in our country is so far away from any change. And we've never thought about this. And when the Syrian revolution started, we were like, all shocked, happy, like, scared, and mixed of feeling, which we've never like, expected that, that could happen. And just like joining the protest and hear your voice for the first time, where you can like shout and chant in something you want you to say, not what they want you to say. It was like something so experienced, like really quite experienced. And filming that also, or capturing any sound or picture or video was like amazing things. Even if it was like bad quality, even if there's no one like in the picture, even if it's just like any feeling that this revolution was something so big for us. And I started like just an activist filming this protest with the people. And there was like thousands of videos who was coming out from Syria on social media. Uh, and some of the channels outside, they were trying to take this footage and like speak about the situation in Syria. And 
I've never expected that five years later I would be like start working on Forsama as a film, as a big mm -hmm. feature project. And I've never expected that two years after working on this, I'll be like sitting here in Amsterdam speaking about an experience which when it started, we've never, it will be ended in this bad situation. We always had that, that hope that what we are doing is the right thing for us and for our mm -hmm. country. And the only thing we hoped to was a free Syria. Syria where people can really choose what they want they can speak what they want, and they can find just some dignity in our life. And I still have that hope. I'm not meaning that this is never didn't happen. That doesn't mean that it will never happen. But it's just like the situation now is too, too bad, and we still alive because we still believe that this is something we need to work on to keep fighting every day. Sorry, this is too long from the no, question. No, it's not too long at all. No, <laughs> but, no. Yeah. No, it's not too long. Don't worry about that at all. We have till uh, six. Um, and I think it is important to share your story uh, beyond the film, the end result of the journey that you have made. Um, how, did you, um, how did you develop your skills, just on a very practical level, because you yeah. weren't a filmmaker before? But you, in the end, you made this amazing film. What did you do in order to be able to do that? So the main things which I've done, and I think it's really developed a lot of skills I have, was like mistakes. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of footage which I've never used, and I don't think anyone could use. And I don't think even like Ed, my fellow director who's working with me in this, even he watched that footage, because it's so worst. <laughs> so I was trying just to develop as much as I can. We had uh, many foreign journalists who they were coming to Syria in different like times. And we were as a citizen journalist, or that's what people usually look to, um, like uh, would uh, call us. They were coming, these foreign journalists who are professional, has a lot of like great equipment. And we, can looking, we were looking at their like equipments like, oh my God, they have mics. We no, we've never had that. Or like, oh, they have like six batteries. I have all, like all my five years, I have one, sometimes two, and that's it. And we were asking them, sharing with them some of this material, which we thought that this is really worth it. Mm -hmm. Like, of, for example, capturing some of the bombing in a very like, close way, or like some of the life which could be interesting to share out. Mm -hmm. And they were giving us some really great feedback, which is like, yeah, why do you need to do this better? You need to take that better. And sometimes like YouTube was something we, we were like trying to share between us as everyone who has a camera and want to do something. Sometimes there's some small courses where some of the organization uh, provide for the people in Turkey or in the Turkish border or sometimes inside Aleppo. But all these things were like just very simple things. Mm -hmm. And I really believe like what make me uh, at the end film in a good way was just how many mistakes I had done through the years. And because I filmed a lot and a lot and a lot, so I've, my eye and my, like all the frames that I've taken or the positions of the cameras, mm -hmm. it's just like with the time, it became like more bitter and bitter. Mm. Um, we're gonna look at the trailer uh, in a short yeah. moment, but there's something about the film that we're gonna talk about um, more. Um, now is that there have been many films made about what's happening in Aleppo, there have been many films made about war and uh, victims, but somehow your film has had such a tremendous impact that even, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's the uh, number one film appreciated by the audience uh, on the ITFA, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, but it's a film that really confronts you, but it also transforms you in a very particular way. That's how I felt it. It was impossible to see the movie and not be moved in the whole spectrum of emotions. Um, and somehow you were able to make a film that's transforming also. So I'd love to talk about that, how you did that particularly. And you already mentioned your co-director, Edward, so let's involve him a little bit in the conversation as well. Um, Let's look at the trailer, yes. if that's okay yeah. with you. Bihalab, Madinti. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
ما حدا منا كان عنده أي فكرة. إيه دكتور حمزة. كيف رح تتغير حياتنا للأبد؟ حمزة أنا حامل. سما 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 عملت هالفيلم مشانك بدي اياك تفهم شو اللي كنا عم نقاتل مشانه سما أنا بعرف إنك عم تفهم شو عم بصير بقدر شوف هالشي بعيونك ما عم تبكي مثل أي طفل عادي وهذا الشي اللي عم يحرق قلبي سامحيني I think um, even say I'm sorry even seeing the trailer is um, uh, very touching um, I think your film has a very unique transformative quality we talked about it before I think it's even a healing film because in the face of all the violence and atrocities, you make a film about love, about courage, and about engagement, compassion, all these things. Was this something that you were aiming for at the start of the project, or how did you start? Was the letter to Sama always there? Yeah, so like through the five years of filming what you've seen in this one, I've never thought to make a film. There was no plan about everything. I was, as I've mentioned before, we started like filming as this is a need for all of us to, to capture what's happening in Syria. Mm -hmm. Because the Assad regime was just, the propaganda of them was like missing everything is happening. And then with the time, every time we felt like this is something really important, we were just like trying to keep going with this. So many, most of the people who were like filming the protest, they became later on a citizen journalist and they were trying to develop what they, their skills, their equipments, and different things. So I've, I moved to East part of Aleppo after like one year and a half of the revolution, where uh, East part of Aleppo was announced that non-government area. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I've, the, first, the first time where I have a camera, and I can really like raise my camera up and film, because the Syrian regime can't be like in this area. And at that time, I realized that this life here is so like strange. So. Even for us, like there was, like the all the uh, regime surfaces was were like just dropping out from this area. So people, like normal people, tried to start a new life in that place, where like some people start like to do bakeries and set up hospitals, uh, schools, and a lot of things. So the area was just left by every uh, responsible for the people, and people start to do everything by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was for me like so amazed, because we knew that we are dreaming of a free Syria, and that area that was just like an example of how we can deal with our life if the regime was like out. Mm -hmm. And just everything was happening was, it, there's something tell you, you need to save this experience, you need to, Film that you need to like keep all everything is happening saved, and like the shelling and the bombing, which they start like being more violence and violence and higher, like as uh, uh, all the situation was so uh, risky. So you feel that all of this need to be also safe because this is an evidence of how the regime is dealing his his own people, 
And then we started like filming everything happening outside from like all the injured people, every like bombing or attacks happening. But also I was also looking inside from the people, from how they like dealing with everything. Mm. And I felt like this is also important, as much as important to like focus on the main things happening, but also there's a lot of details which they they make everything like so clear. So I, people around me, they were, okay, was my, I have my camera, I'm filming everything around. And they were like a lot of understanding why I'm filming like maskers or people who've been like killed or attacks. But no one understand like why I'm going to film us where we are preparing dinner. Mm -hmm. Or while we, they like some guys from the hospital going to play football. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why are you filming this? This is not important. And I felt just like, you know, to see the balance of everything, to mm -hmm. see the full picture of that was so important. And they were all the time telling me like, oh, stop, stop, don't film us. Like they were fighting between uh, uh, them like as uh, playing or something. And I was like, turn my camera on. And they were like, stop, don't film us. And they realized all of us, even me. I knew this is Im important for mm -hmm. me, but I've never thought how important is it. Mm -hmm. Until we lost one of our very close friends. Uh, we were living together in the hospital for six months, and there was a very nice like moments of the life there. And as a girl, I came to this area alone, with no family, with no one I know. So we felt that there's a new family started like to be established in that area. And like suddenly, one of us was like, killed and the day before after we he was killed we were sitting all together at night and I was showing the other, my friends some of the material that I have and everyone was like so shocked you know that this is reality and this is could be finished at any second mm -hmm. so even this like mo mo moments of joy or happiness this mm -hmm. is need to be recorded and this is really explain who we are and what we were trying to do and since that time, like never ever someone told me like to turn my camera down or don't film. And they were sometimes so annoying <laughs> because like, okay, they knocked on my door 4 a.m. because they want like, they are playing cards and they want me to film this. <laughs> <laughs> so it became really like appreciated from the people around. Yeah. And that's given me a lot of like support to continue filming everything. The horror in one side, but also mm. the other things happening at the, at the second side. Mm. And also, it has been said by critics, and I think um, this is a really important issue also, the fact that you're a woman filmmaker is very important because we get a completely different perspective. Yeah. Most of the films we see from war zones or conflicts are uh, uh, through the lens of male photographers, journalists, filmmakers. Were you aware of that, that you had that particular perspective from the moment you were starting filming? Like in some places, yes, I have that. Mm -hmm. And I can, but I've never like really realized how important is it how, and how different is it from mm -hmm. others until like I made for summer and this footage went out. Uh, in some places, like usually all the, my friends, uh, there's some of them which is were amazing with me and just trying to support me to do a lot of filming. And if they want to go for to risk a place or something, they were like, what, come with us. And like they are doing, you know, some kind of protection huh. with them. And they were amazing with this. But also there's this other people which they were looking at me that, oh, she's just playing with her camera. She's a woman, she can't do anything with this camera. And I have that mixed feeling between some of, some people really like see that, you know. And you can realize that from people how you look at you and then, the first year, second year, then became like something so uh, people need to accept that. It's not in their choice to say yes or no for her to be here, or mm -hmm. it's not to say to look at her in different, in bad way, because they've seen me, for example, going with the civil defense or the white helmet to a place where it's under attack, or with the hospital uh, emergency car where they're going, like, for example, to check some people who are under the rebels. So, start people feel like, yeah, she's a woman, but oh, she can work as us. Mm. <laughs> but they've never felt about how the importance really until this film went out. Yeah. When they felt that I had a very amazing access to other women. Mm -hmm. People like when they speak with me, they speak in different way when they speak to other like men, even men themselves. Uh, there's a lot of things where when we deal with women, 
we have a lot of shared uh, principles or shared uh, like situation where I can understand them very well because I was pregnant and I, I had later on Sama in my hand while I'm filming. And women usually, they love to speak. We love to speak. <laughs> we love to share a lot of things. When we are scared from anything, we don't want to like hide it. We want to speak it out. And that was like some of the main things between when I was like filming people outside and filming other women. They want to speak with me. They want to share a lot of things with me. While I don't think they want to do this with any other like guy. Mm -hmm. And it was really like so clear from what you've seen in the film. Sometimes people like ask me, oh, why you focusing on other women and on children? And I was like, I've never focused about that. As a woman, I'm, I usually am go to other women. Like it's more about what, it it, what interests me, what I, I felt that this is really important because I have the same experience in different levels of that situation. So I really knew like what other women matter or what they really go through. And even like between me and my husband, Hamza, who was also featured in the film, sometimes when like there is some fears in my mind, I was putting the camera on and start speak with the camera. And there's one scene in the film when I was just like, have a lot of like fears and I was just want to tell that to someone. And that's someone, I don't want to be someone who are there because it's a lot of like bad emotional and I don't want to affect anyone with my, what I'm mm -hmm. having now. While I know like if Hamza wants to do this, like he will never do it. He will just like try to pretend that it's okay. And you can see that in many, many places in the film. But in the, at the end, like I'm a woman and I'm a mother. So a lot of this experience, which I shared with people, it's something I'm, I'm living and I lived through and I just feel it's so important for the people outside to, to see this. Like to say war or revolution, it's not about just like people is fighting. There's mm -hmm. a whole community behind this. Mm -hmm. It is so uh, important that you're saying this because Although I'm very, uh, well, I have my 50-50 uh, button here for the women who are um, uh, advo advocating uh, the position of women in the film industry. But even with all my knowledge and understanding of gender imbalances, yeah. I didn't realize how much I missed that female gaze in war until I saw your film. Because and then I realized how much I never heard, never saw about how it affects women and children and on what level and also the way you did it. So just by seeing your film, I realized what has never been told, showed or seen by anyone. So I think because also like this sound or the voice mm -hmm. of any conflict zone is usually it's for the like for the conflict itself, for yes. the uh, fighting, for mm -hmm. the weapons and things that's happening. And usually any journalist who will come to that area, who will see that that's so obvious that this is what we are coming to cover. Mm -hmm. But for a woman who lived through this, I felt that like generally that's what's happening. Because I was with this, like living in that neighborhood, I have my daughter, I, had, I was pregnant, I went to the doctor where you know, like other women go, so I can meet these people. I can feel like what the real need or the real voice on the ground, not just than the voice that you hear, the voice that you could never hear, but you need to hear it as well. Yeah. And also in the responses you got from other women, yeah. there was, can you tell something about it? Because I've found it really interesting how that works also. How it in kind of, even the film liberates women yeah. on the perspective they have on themselves, yeah. Yeah, like uh, yesterday at, at the party, I wish she is here, I don't know, but maybe. Someone, uh, a mother come to me and she was telling me about the film and how she moved by the film. And then she was telling me like, I'm sorry, I want to ask you something totally out of the film itself, but how you do this with a little baby? I have a baby now and it's one year old, uh, one year old and like, I'm just thinking about, I have a film, and I don't know if I can make it or not with the baby. And you, like, you have two babies. Because she was babies. a filmmaker yeah, too. Yeah. You have two babies, yes. and you have the film, and you are now also touring around. So, like, how you make that? And I felt just really like it's so small detail in the whole of the film, but it's also so important. And I was, like, trying to make it so, like, simple way that, like, we as a mo mother, we can, we used to do, like, separate things, like different things together. When you have like to feed the baby and do some stuff on the phone and like 
maybe with, the, with our legs we can do something different. And that's the same things why we can do really a lot of things. And just like, think, don't think about it. Don't think about that stress, but think about that. Like you are as a mom or as a woman, you are able to do like many things together. And I'm sure like you can make it as I did. Oh. And like it was just very lovely conversation because I've never thought about, you know, like, oh, this is also an achievement for a woman or mm -hmm. like woman can really think that it's not just like to be a journalist, you can be a mom. And if you are a mom, you can do anything else in your life. No, mm -hmm. we are able to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But because that's the perception and that's also something women get to hear very often. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you proved uh, uh, it is uh, it is all possible. Not just me, you know. I, I'm, I believe that many women around mm -hmm. the world, they have, they do something really like harder than that, you know, and most like risky than that's what I've done. But it's just, they are not in, under the light to speak about that experience. And I'm sure like everyone, every one of us has like something about his mother or her mother about an experience. And when we just start like talk about this and realize it, you will feel that it's just like it's everywhere around us, but mm -hmm. we can't see that. Yes. Um, I think that's another great gift that you're bringing uh, with you and the film. Uh, I'd love to talk about um, your co-director. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, Edward, <laughs> you mentioned stand. Edward. Yes. yes, can you please stand <laughs> up? Call. This is Edward, the co-director of the film. <laughs> Edward Watts, to be precisely. Um, can I ask you a question also? Because maybe you should say first, what was it like to collaborate? Do we have an extra microphone? Do you want oh, to be can honest or not honest? <laughs> Whatever you want. Of course, we like to honesty. Be honest. But <laughs> um, what was it like to collaborate? Because you were in uh, Aleppo, you were in the UK. How did you do that? So I met Edward right after I left, and I finished everything like as a filming. Mm -hmm. uh, and w in everything I've done, I've never had any chance to share that with anyone who is who's outside. Uh, but when I just left and I realized that now it's the time to do something with this material and there's really need to that. Uh, I was working at that time with Channel 4 News in the UK. I was sending to them some material and they were broadcasting that in their daily program. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I left, I come to them as I know them very well, and I've told them I have all this material. But I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. And I had no experience about doing like big films. Everything I was know who is my limit experience inside. And emotionally, I can't do that alone. I really need like someone who can support me and take the lead in many places where I can't judge a lot of emotion in the film. And also, like it's really need someone who is outside to understand the Western audience or the people who outside, how they look at Syria and how they knew about Syria. And for me, I always was inside, like too much inside. And mm. because it's my story also, I really needed someone to be like balancing between these two things. Mm -hmm. And that's where Edward came to the project and they introduced us to each other. And it was really like two years of great experience for me. I was like, I learned a lot from that. And uh, now I can say like, I can, I am able to go forward for my next project by myself or trying to help another people who are inside to do their pro mm -hmm. project with, 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 with uh, each other, which is really for me was so supportive process and so great. And it just usually what's happening in people like me who's coming from conflict zone that the outsider uh, co-director or the, the director, usually they take all the, the credits. They've mm -hmm. never been credited in the right way. <coughs> and that's just, uh, just like losing some of the film itself, a lot of uh, soul, because if you weren't inside, if you weren't mm -hmm. really looking at the real experience, this is, will not be the perfect film. Yes. <coughs> Take a drink, and I'll, I Edward talk along speak. with uh, Edward. Um, this is, I think, very important what you say because that the nature of that collaboration really is important in the way the soul of the project, the 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 tone of voice <coughs> is maintained within the project. Apparently, Edward, you are able to 
facilitate that or to support that? How, how do you look at that? How, what was your perspective on that collaboration? Well, one, one thing to begin with, I'd just like to mention one of the <coughs> amazing women who is involved in the project, who's the editor, Chloe oh, Lamborn, Chloe. who is here. Hi. Hey. Can you please stand up? Yeah. Stand up. Yes. <laughs> this is like one of the great... Sorry, one of the greatest unrecognized documentary editors in the world. So here she is. And she was an incredible uh, fulcrum between Wad and I, who are both quite headstrong people, <laughs> as okay. you see. And so we had strong <laughs> opinions, and Chloe was an incredible arbiter. But um, I think, you know, what I hope is that this film is an example of the empowerment of people uh, who are living in these situations, as Wad mm -hmm. did, as all over the world, there are these situations going on in Yemen, in Hong Kong, and all these places where mm -hmm. people need to be empowered to tell their own stories, you know? And I always, for so long, one of the reasons why they called me was because I felt what was happening in Syria from the early days of the revolution was so important for, like, the future of mankind, if that doesn't sound mm -hmm. ridiculous, because no, no. of the elemental forces that are at work, which you see in the film, which is, like, the best of human beings being met by the worst of human mm -hmm. beings, and how that battle worked out was going to affect us all, and I think it has. You know, we talked about it in my country, Britain, like, would Brexit be happening if the refugee crisis and the rise of ISIS hadn't been allowed to happen? I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. discuss. But, so for me, like, I always wanted to make films about people like Wad and Hamza, the peaceful protesters who were trying to just get the rights that we take for granted and being met with this violence. And they never worked out, those projects. <laughs> I was like stopped at the border or I wrote a terrible script or whatever it was. And so when finally they were like, Wad, I knew about her work, I knew about her news reports, when they were like, she's gathered this huge archive, can they, they're looking for someone to support her, basically, to tell her story in the best way. It was an incredible honor for me to just use whatever skills and knowledge I had to try and help like make this amazing person and her incredible footage accessible to not just all of us. I feel like this is the choir in this room, you know, people are naturally engaged in this subject, but to try and reach beyond to people who never engaged with Syria before, who didn't understand, you know, like we had this hilarious one the other day where this woman was like saying, you know, I, I, we saw the film and it's like, oh, you, you're just like us, like, you have babies like us, you know, you get married wow. like us, you know, yeah. and that's, that, but that's what you're dealing with, you're dealing with, and, and forgive them, because like, as storytellers, it was another thing I felt from the West, we'd mm -hmm. done such a disservice to the revolution and to our fellow human beings, by never telling the story right, you know, by falling into the regime trap mm -hmm. that it was all about terrorists, you know, and, and so people never understood that like, their brothers and sisters their human, fellow human beings were fighting for their freedom and fighting for all of our freedom. And anyway, it's just a way of saying it was a <laughs> privilege to work with this amazing person. And thank you for doing this because I realized that, uh, like you said, there's that collaboration of somebody who's experiencing everything firsthand and with a person who has... Uh, access to financial resources or no. the world. <laughs> no well, financial <laughs> resources, I wish. Maybe not you, but that could be the producer and the production company, Channel 4, all these uh, uh, parties. But also to have an eye that is able to collaborate with you in order to build a narrative that resonates with a broader audience. But apparently, and I felt that even when I had a talk with you um, before this conversation, that you have the kind of sensitivity to profoundly understand what it takes to be in a position like you are as an outsider. Um, and uh, excuse me if I'm telling maybe some personal things, but I think also the fact even you as a man, or even as a white English man, have Bastard. has a series. Bastard. <laughs> yes. yes. Bastard. I'm sorry to pull you out you of the You ruined the world. Closet. I'm just yes. trying to make up for it. <laughs> but you also have a very profound understanding what it means to be a woman in this world yeah. because of your personal history. A little bit. Like I was raised by a single mum who was a mm -hmm. journalist, which is exactly what you were just talking about. And like from very early on, I saw firstly how much she had to deal with just in a daily life to like deal with me and deal with her job. But the prejudice the hostility, the belittling, like all of this horrendous uh, stuff that I think women have to go through or have done for many years until now. I was learning that from a very young age, like mm -hmm. seeing how, seeing the emotional toll that it took on my mum. And uh, so that's why for me, like I'm just trying to 
show that we're not all assholes. Basically. <laughs> and also, like, you know, as a, where I came from, which is Syria, we, I thought this is just like our, uh, like, fighting as a something. We just, in our country, like, women doesn't have the right, like, men. Mm -hmm. And in the filmmaking, also the same thing. So in 2013, I uh, went to, uh, they, they want to do something like um, journalism, journalists union for all these journalists in the city okay. to start like work together as like we want to build something to protect us as some of the rights and the work and how we can help each other to develop our skills. And I went to that meeting, which is one of the scenes in the film was in that meeting. Uh, like there was 121 journalists and citizen journalist. And I was the only female between wow. these guys. Wow. And like, I was, you know, like I was shy when I get in because what I'm dealing here, like it's not just one or two and some of the people who I know, there's people who are totally different in their mind and in their thinking about how we can deal together. And I was like, you know, I will, I will be with them because I am here and I'm working as them. So we, we had that really good conversation and they were all like really respectful my my appearance between them but also i was the only one you know like wow. it's so hard and tough but then like i was really shocked that's that that was 2013 in 2017 right after everything finished and i went out to england we were nominated for inside aleppo the work that i've done with channel 4 news mm -hmm. and the for the rts award for the camera operator of the year and when I won that one, but when I won it, uh, the, uh, the people who were introducing the award, they were saying like, this is the first time for 26 years, a female took wow. this award, the camera operator, which usually it's men, because wow. men is going to, to film, Mon men is having all these like big cameras to film. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I've, it's not about Syria. It's not about just like the place where I came from. It's about over the world. Mm -hmm. Like in a place like England, still people like in some places there's m like women are not even existed in that situation. Yeah. And that's when I realized that really like as much as I can do in this film, it's really important, not just for us in Syria, but also in over, over the world that female filmmakers are as you said, like 50-50, and it's not even about 50-50, this is not a need, this mm -hmm. is like must be, and this is also, could be not even a percentage, like whatever it was, it was normally could be like in that position. Yeah, it's incredible what, uh, what this film um, kind of shows uh, to the world in all different aspects, everything that hasn't been seen or done before. Um, and this also brings me to the other aspect I, I talked about right at the beginning. The film is so engaging in many ways and so f inviting us to look at this whole conflict and the whole situation with new eyes, with uh, a different perspective, that um, it calls upon your own courage. What would I do? What can I do? How can I support or how can I um, help from here to relief whatever in um, the people that you've been with and people like you uh, what can we do as an audience what can i do so if we put the slide please and it's really like the film as a film itself mm -hmm. it gives you a lot of like feeling that i want to do something mm -hmm. and that's one of the things which was surprising us all the team Mm -hmm. Because when we were working on the film for two years, they were pe many people told us that no one is will come to watch an inter Syrian film. No one is coming to watch like a film about blood and refugee, mm -hmm. and people need something totally different. And people are really bored from this uh, like kind of films. But we were like, whatever it will be, like we will do it because I have to do this for Syria first. Mm -hmm. And then it was so surprising how people all over the world were engaging with this. And they were coming to us and say like, same question, like, what can we do? Please mm -hmm. give us anything we can do. And some other people who sharing like very lovely stories of something they've done before for Syrians or for some refugees all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they were feeling that, oh, like, we sorry, we just did this, but like this is itself, it's amazing to be done. Yes. And that's why we felt that the film itself is not enough, mm -hmm. but what we need also to give people a lot of tools to uh, like make uh, them 
uh, able to, to interact with this and do action for that. Okay. So we launched this impact campaign called Action for Sama, and we're still like in the early days of that, but we're also doing very well in this. And I hope every one of you can, and everyone who watched the film, and like really go to the website and speak about like what can, you'll see like find of a kind of the tools where you can do different kind of the things, but the main things of our message through the film, that what you've seen in the film and what you will see, it's still happening so far. So the film is not just about a story and it's like finish. It's about something you can do right now. And the main things about bombing hospitals, and uh, you can see the hashtag is stop bombing hospitals because it's still happening every day. And just two days ago, there was a, a Assad regime like targeted a camp for refugee inside Syria. And uh, there was like a pediatrician hospital who was attacked and 20 people were killed, like including like nurses and uh, children. And just like, you know, this is still happening and this is something we shouldn't really discuss in this world anymore. Mm -hmm. Like hospitals and medical facilities shouldn't be target whatever the situation was. But we are unfortunately <coughs> living in a, in a world which it doesn't matter anymore and doesn't matter in Syria, that means that it will not be matter in any, in any other place all over the world. So we can support that campaign to stop bombing hospitals yes. and healthcare um, facilities, but also on the website there's more information about yeah. what we can do. Uh, the, there's many, many kind of things. If you are really interested in the political things, you can do different things. You can mm -hmm. write to your representative about their specific thing which we, we want to gather people to do and hoping that we can really make change in this. Mm -hmm. You can also just like be in solidarity with the people who were uh, like uh, inside suffering. And there's someone here, which I just realized that, uh, like, can you stand up please? Yes, yeah. Does the person you, know no, who you. is? The picture. Okay, there's a journalist here. She doesn't know where. Yes, you. Oh. <laughs> Can you stand up, please? So, and when I was inside Aleppo during the film, I, I've got like around 200 messages from people in Holland. Okay, yeah. 300 messages. 200 messages. 200 yeah. messages, okay. And these people, they were writing to us saying just like, I don't know them, they don't know me. They just were writing that. Like, Quad, we love you so much. We are in, with you in everything you are do. Wow. Like, we just wish you all the best in everything. And she sent me a mess, like a picture for her in one of the squares here where they were like lighting candles for Syria. Oh, wow. And I can't describe really like what I felt at that second when I knew that we are stuck here and we could have been killed at any minute. And these some people who are really thinking about us. And we just met yesterday in one interview and she showed me the picture which she sent it to me, oh. the real picture, the original one, and she gave it to me. Oh. And this is something of the, which I will never forget in all my life. And this is something all of us can do in a very simple way to tell the people who are inside suffering that there's someone around the world who's caring about them. This is one of the action on the website. There's many, many other things where you can do, but it's really like, Maybe something for you, it means nothing, but maybe for other people, they, it's really mean the whole life. Wow. It, Thank you so much really for you and for everyone who sent that you. message. This is really important to know how much uh, this affects you in, uh, in a very important way. Um, I want to give the floor to you. I'm sorry I took so much time of you. So I, I saw some hands raised. I saw there, there, and there. Yeah, Let me first one. begin with this lady here in the front, then um, Samuel, and then two in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Wait for the microphone to arrive because it's all being um, okay. recorded. Hi, I'm Barbara from Hi. Amsterdam. Um, curious to see you uh, watch your movie. But um, actually, my first comment is just only shouldn't we try to stop the bombing altogether? And stop the war there in uh, sorry can you just keep the mic shouldn't yeah. we try to stop the war altogether in syria instead of only the hospitals stop bombing everything 
Well, anyway, my question is, um, um, did your movie uh, uh, change the position of, the f uh, of women in uh, Syria, do you think? So the main things about this, unfortunately, so far we can't release the film in Syria because most of the areas are under the regime control. So there's no way to make that happen there. But what we are trying to do also, like because there's six million refugees all over the world, and most of these people are in Europe. So we mm -hmm. are trying to release the film in many countries. We had already released in France. It will be released here, like after the festival in January 23rd in cinemas. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know how much that could affect their, this other woman lives. But also I really hope that we had opportunity to like being released in different places where there's a conflict also out mm -hmm. of Syria. And I, I hope that, you know, it's more about how we can be all together, like proving to each other that anything could be possible if we are just like want to do that. Mm. I'm sorry, there's uh, somebody <coughs> in the back there? No, and then there's a question up there. I'm so, I hope to come to you later, yeah. Yes, this is Samuel. Thank you so much for uh, getting the opportunity to ask you a question because what the film made me realize is that for a lot of us people, trauma can paralyze you, which makes it impossible to move, which makes it impossible to flee, to even talk. So how would you uh, advise people if they're in a certain situation where trauma is, is paralyzing them? What was your way of coping with the trauma and all that death around you and the sorrow and then what kept you going on? What was the motor to cope with the trauma? So, uh, so hard. But like the main things about the trauma, which I have that already, but I'm just trying to ignore this. The fact that what, you, what I lived through, I knew that this is still happening until now. So I feel that I, don't, I shouldn't think about myself and about what I'm going through now. It's more about the urgent of there's something more important to be working on. And part of the like trauma retreatment or the ignoring that it could be useful in a position when I have two kids and I have my husband. We both like traumatized from different kind of things from what we went through, but also it's good because we are together and we can support each other. The main things about the belief that we have that this is will not stay forever. And someone just yesterday in a conversation, they were saying, yeah, but like Assad is still ruling Syria and what you are useful from all of this. And I was, yeah, he's ruling Syria today. He was ruling Syria like eight, eight years ago, but like he could rule Syria in the next 10 years, but like nothing will stay forever. And that really, for me, you know, it gives me a lot of hope that whatever the situation was and whatever it was bad, I believe that the right thing will happen at the end. And I've see, as I've seen you, yeah, that one day Syria will be like free out of them and we will keep fighting for that day. So just, I don't know really like if that's useful for you or not, but the only thing is just like, we don't need to win. We just wanted to support the right side, whatever it's happened. In the back. Uh... Hey, thank you for a beautiful movie. I uh, <coughs> just, when I was watching it, I was just missing some parts of um, the scene, like parts of the political scene. Like, I knew that somehow Al-Qaeda branch, like Japan, Nusra, and also they are, some extremists were also fighting, defending Aleppo. I, and I couldn't understand like the connection between them, the relationship with what you were doing. And also I could never see any militants wounded there. Like, did you also take care of the, these people who were, how was living under that? Like, like I didn't, I missed that part of the story. Once you said that this is, Islamists are making our life even more, I mean, something you mentioned about them, that yeah. things are getting more extremist. But I really didn't, didn't get this whole, of course your movie was not about, it was about uh, peop, children and people who were not, and they were just affected by all these things. 
it was not focused on the political and I don't know other groups, but I was just like I knew there was something I can, I don't see and I went to ask how was yeah, that. But you felt that there was something bad, right? I you felt like there's part of like yeah something bad about the extremist and of course I yeah. I know that that's bad and I know that you said some once and I yeah. I didn't know I just said that probably you had to take all that scene out of the movie like you had to not to talk about that part no. because, um, yeah. but then in the same time, the, the, although I love the movie, but it sounds like, oh, it's a city that nobody is fighting there, just Assad is bombing some people who can defend themselves. Yeah. But I knew this is not the reality. There are some people who are fighting there, but we don't see them. Yeah, can I so see? That's a, yeah, that's a yeah so because you felt that there's something is wrong about the extremists, that's really how our life were, was affected by them. It's maybe like from 95 minutes of our life, there's one minute, the effect of this extremist in, in, on our life. They weren't in our side. We weren't like love them. They weren't loving us. And we were as an activist, part of like the attack that they were trying to do as kidnapping some, some people or arresting some people. But the main like dangerous thing for us in Syria was the regime. The regime in Syria is responsible for over 85% of the destruction and the deaths in Syria. And that's not my like uh, opinion. This is fact you can research Data. online to see. Yeah. And ISIS, and I know the whole world is busy with ISIS mm -hmm. and what's happened, they're responsible of 5% mm -hmm. of the death and destruction in Syria. This and is also part of the propaganda, of course. Exactly. Right? Yeah, and that's why that important. Yeah. the film wasn't missing something. It mm -hmm. was totally the life that I went through. But it's more about giving you the real reflect of our life. The whole film, you can see like wh why these people were being targeted, just because they are against, not the government, they were against being, live in bad situation as no freedom, no dignity, and, no and a lot of injustice. And also like the fact that even this extremist and ISIS, for us, they were part of the regime. Maybe not in very indi direct way, but of course, like they were in indirect way. The, in 2012, the Assad regime announced that he released a lot of people who were uh, arrested because of their opinion. But what he really done, he wasn't releasing the people who were activists like me, who were arrested after the revolution. He was releasing all the people who they, he knew absolutely that they, they will become later part of Al-Qaeda or part of ISIS. And this is also a fact, it's not what I'm saying. And they're really like, on Action for Summer, we will add a lot of these articles. We're still like doing a lot of research to find what the right things for people to read. But this is like literally something people in, some people in the West, they do a lot of long research about this. And these people, they became leaders of ISIS leader of Al-Qaeda, and we knew that all of us. But you can't do anything in that situation when you feel like, you know, like there's no way to open this battle against these people while you have like a bigger like battle like the regime. And there was simple things which affect me like personally as Wa'ad, as a person. I've never put Al-Hijab, and I'm, I'm Muslim, but I don't do that. So when I was in Aleppo, I was I, 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 I put it because I felt that this is not a thing where I want to think about right now. Mm -hmm. While there's a barrel bomb is like falling all over our mm -hmm. heads as a big neighborhood. So I felt like this is my personal freedom now. And I know this is so important for me and for whole Syria later. But this is now, it's something more important. Mm -hmm. And I am sure, and this is really like common feeling in Syria, if the regime went out and if the regime fall down, a lot of things will, will be like different, like directly. All of these Islamic people who are pretending that they are Islamic or they people who were like with Al-Qaeda, who, jo who joined ISIS, if they have another opportunity of life of, or if they have justice, the things will not be what, what happened later. Mm -hmm. So it's a very dangerous narrative huh? yeah. that so-called uh, the journalistic, the, the dominant journalistic perspective of these extremist groups being a huge part of the problem. Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. And like for me personally, my cousin who was arrested by the regime twice, mm -hmm. he he's kidnapped. He was kidnapped by ISIS in 2013, and so far we have no idea where is he. 
-hmm. As my cousin, there's at least 50 activists from Aleppo city who were like kidnapped. And there's names who are like, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with like uh, uh, the father, uh, uh, Paolo, uh, mm -hmm. Paolo the father who's like also, who was very famous in Syria and he went to ISIS to speak with them about why you're doing this and he was just like disappear. And many other people like James Foley, the journalist mm -hmm. who were in East part of Aleppo in 2012, he was like a friend of Hamza and then like ISIS kidnapped him and then they like murder him in front of the like lenses and the whole world watched this. All these people were supporting the revolution and mm -hmm. all of these people were against the regime and against ISIS at the same time. But you know like, the, problem, the main problem is Assad. He's mm -hmm. the result, like these people as Al-Qaeda or ISIS, they are the result of that. Mm -hmm. And when they, Assad will, will, will come and if they were still in Syria, we have of course another revolution against these people. Yes, yeah. yes uh, you had a question. I didn't uh, forget yeah, about you. Yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, and th this is the perfect moment, that uh, I'm struck by how much your film supports justice. Assad is a criminal, and you have provided really important evidence of that criminality. So uh, Thank you. It's, it's powerful in, in that way also, mm -hmm. I think, as yes. evidence. Thank yes. you so much. Very important point. So uh, uh, let me see. There was a gentleman in the back, and there's a lady there to the right. I saw you, and there's yeah. Okay, we have to hurry up a little bit. So can you make your question really brief? Sure. Uh, and thank you, Ad. Thank, thank you, Edward, you. for this beautiful film. Um, I would like to go to the editing room and uh, talk a little bit about the uh, form. Uh, yeah. of this film. Uh, obviously, I think that making this film as a postcard to Sema was not a decision you made early on. Uh, if you can take me through the process and the scenarios that you considered before making it the way it is right now. Yeah. Because you had you know, all of this 500 hours of rushes <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a tough decision uh, scheming through all of this material. Thank yeah, you. so we had like thousands of scenarios of how the film could be. And we literally, with great one editor, and we have previous one, his name is Simon, and the Chloe, like, the, we've tried everything we could do. Like, it's not smart to have what we have. <laughs> it was like, again, mistakes and mistakes and mistakes. How and long did you edit? Two years. Okay. Just, just, yeah. like, just editing. Mm -hmm. I can and imagine, the great yeah. things about, like, Chloe, that, you know, whatever you want to try, even if it's too stupid, like, idea, she said like, oh, let me show you. And she's not giving you any previous like comment about this. And me and Edward, we were like trying to find a way to tell the story in different, different ways. And we tried really like a lot of ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. But then like for some idea was really reflecting the truth of the experience. And because what we were fighting for from minute one in this revolution, it was for best future. And Sama, when she came, she was a very symbol of now this future is need to be like real uh, happening because I have a daughter now. And that was like this conversation about everything was for Sama, for Sama, for Sama. Sama as a symbol for all the children who are living in that circumstances, for all the great things which we want to have later. So it was just like, uh, like an idea which we felt both me and Edward that this is link the whole film all together. And we felt like with Chloe and many other people in the project that at the beginning no one was really like sure that this is the right thing to do, but we mm -hmm. felt both that we will take this responsibility and we will try it. And Chloe said, yes, I'm with you. So <laughs> we don't need anyone else a part of the editor and two headstrong directors. <laughs> and we were really fighting a lot between us, three of us, sometimes both like agree on something, Ed not, sometimes Ed and Chloe, not me. And just we were trying to find out how we can make it really, like just being reality of what we went through. And really for some idea was like so uh, obvious that this is really the right thing to do. Do you want to add anything? Thank you. Great. There was a question up there. Yeah. Sorry. You. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to be really brief. Um, Wad, I haven't seen the film, um, and I came very quickly. I lived in Syria a long time ago before all of this started. Um, I wanted to say, um, a couple of years ago, I saw the film by Obaide Zaitoun, um, which was also co-directed with a male director who came from a much wealthier country, or at least um, production-wise, a, a better country well, to work in. the name of the film? Um, it was called The War Show. Have you seen it? Anyway, no, I won't. Sorry. I won't keep it. Keep it. I won't delay. But um, it was Danish money that was behind it. A lot of Danish money. It was a Danish. Co I think Danish co-director. He has a Danish-sounding name. And I don't. It's no comment about the quality of your experience working with Edward, working together. But I just. It's kind of striking. You know, it is kind of striking. Two women who both have very original material, different material, very very different perspectives. And um, in comes the the big money, and it, I don't know how much of it was taken out of your hands. I'm very curious about that, that whole process of where did you feel you might have been tempted to tell things a certain way, and they were pulled in because there might have been, you know, other people say this is how we see it or this is how it should go. And I don't mean that in an aggressive or a nasty way at all, but I, I'm a journalist and it's what I write about, so I'd like to see you after, if I may. Thank you. Thank you. So I will say, like, in this project, I was number one in everything. And I'm really now, I can say that very clearly, because during the process, I was, I, I didn't realize that from the beginning. And they were just trying to give me that support and trust that, like, it's your story, how you want to say this, how you want to do that. And really, Edward's role was more about being, like, behind me like support me in any way that, you know, like what do you want to do? And sometimes there's some very like strong conversation between us about how we want to do this. And like if he didn't convince in something and he's just trying to convince me in that for two weeks, I'm so headstrong. And that was so <laughs> obvious in the film. But I was like, yeah, no, 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 no. And then the end like, yeah, no means no, and that's it. And it was really like, I was afraid, and sometimes if I really said yes, like, they will say that I'm happy with this, but I'm not. So we were very honest to each other, and that's really give us a very, like, it make the whole work is more like harder, <laughs> but also it give us like more reality of the, the experience. And the production company, which is Channel 4 and Channel 4 News and ITN production and Frontline BBS in America, all of them, they were like, try to give me the whole space about, are you okay to say, to say this? And sometimes, many times, of the same idea, because they think if I'm, if I'm really just like, because I'm under pressure, or if I'm just stressed a lot, mm -hmm. or whatever. And the same things about my personal story, or how much I want to put in this. They were just like, every time, just want to make sure that, are you okay, are you happy? And especially with the trauma things, because in some places I felt like I can't do that anymore. They were, could like really stop for weeks, even if that will affect the film, and they will affect their money, which they put in the film. They were just want to make sure that I'm really okay to continue in this and not cause any more problems because I'm living the experience again and again. And I just really love to speak about that experience a lot because like, I felt this was so exceptional in many places. I've seen many of my fellow citizen journalists and my fellow journalists who were like, doing films about Syria, sometimes because of the money, sometimes because of the experience, which the lack of the experience, which we have. It's usually what you see in the film is not like the people who filmed it or lived it. They are not really satisfied on this. And in this situation was like totally different. And I really love to speak about this and encourage other production companies and other people to support the real people who did mm -hmm. the work to speak us. It's, you know, the, at the end, all of this will be for the purpose of having a perfect film as it should be. Because when people who lived it or filmed it, they are part of this process. Like, trust me, everything will be more like close to the people. Everything will be more reality, and everything will be better for the film itself. Mm -hmm. And that's really what For Summer had. Yeah. I think um, it should be like that. So I'm sorry to hear about, I know that no, things I, can be I very different. I know many, but, many examples yeah. like this. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, like, we need to change that in any Yes. Way. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that, uh, in your case, you had the final yes. say in everything. 
I am so sorry because uh, it would be great, I think, to talk for an hour more. Yeah. But you have to leave again yes. to uh, go to the Fly. next uh, <laughs> festival, next audience, who's also eager to see the film and talk to you. So I'm very sorry for people who have more questions. But I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you. I want to thank what? you and thank you all. And please follow the campaign yes. and help as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Edward. Thank you, Chloe. And for the Dutch people in the audience, January 23rd, it will be in the theaters. Please go. Please take everyone a film you have to see. And, and there's also one screening in 1st of December in the festival. If you okay, 1st of watch. December, yeah. still on Etfa. But probably sold out already? Well, just try it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.